Hi everyone, I'm Stan Mallow, the Paranormal Yacker. My guest on today's show is Jose Maria Barrera. I'll be talking with him about his book, Dendera, Temple of Time, The Celestial Wisdom of Ancient Egypt. Jose is a software engineer and application architect specializing in data representation and languages. He has been fascinated by alchemy and Egyptian culture for more than 20 years, is an avid photographer, and his works exhibited in galleries in Chicago and New York City and sold at Sotheby's auctions. Born in Columbia, he holds a master's degree in computer science and lives in New York City. Jose Maria Barrera, welcome to Paranormal Yakker. Stan, thank you so much for having me. It is an honor and a pleasure. As stated in my introduction, Jose, you have been fascinated by alchemy and Egyptian culture for more than 20 years. What is the root of that fascination? So I came first into alchemy and for a weird and strange reason, and it was that like around 20 years ago, I had some money on a bank investment account. One day I called to see what my money was doing. And they were like, oh, like 60% of your money is gone. And I was like, what do you mean by that? And they were like, yeah, you lost the money. And I was like, oh my God, but this is like, if I put my car in a parking lot, and then I go for my car back and they're like, oh, sorry, we couldn't find the back seat of your car or something like that. So that day I realized that I had no idea about money or anything related to that. And I realized I like to ask fundamental questions about things because I want to understand things, how they work. And I want to understand them deeply. So I asked a very simple question at the time and it was, what is money? The moment that you ask that question, you open this door that I never expected that I would end up studying alchemy in order to solve that question in particular. And then magic or topics like that. Later on, by pure chance, I ended up in a, an exhibition of Egypt here in New York City. I was mesmerized by what I saw at that uh, exhibition. I realized that I had to go to Egypt. That's the inception of this book, basically. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Dendera Temple of Time is a magnificent, full-color exploration of the encoded ceiling at the Temple of Dendera, one of the best-preserved temples of ancient Egypt. What, Jose, can you tell me about its history? The temple is a late temple in the ancient Egyptian culture. It's a rather new temple in Egyptian standards. It's like around 2000 years old. It's one of the last temples that were built in pretty much at the decline already of the Egyptian uh, civilization. This temple in particular is located in a sacred spot where they have been finding uh, remnants of old temples that were there and they were reconstructed on top of them so the, the structure that is today there is from around 2000 years ago a little bit more uh, and is dedicated to one of the oldest goddess in the egyptian culture that is the goddess hathor the goddess hathor is the goddess of love is the goddess of music and joy is the goddess of fertility and her oldest incarnation or oldest image is that of a cow. So she's the sacred cow goddess of Egypt. By the time that this temple was built, she was already 6,000 years old or something like uh, as a worship in Egypt. She had acquired many attributes along that time and merged with many other goddesses. She was already uh, being conflated with the goddess Isis. Now, this temple is dedicated to the goddess Hathor, but there is a lot of imagery about the other goddess Isis, which was the wife of the god Osiris. Your book draws on more than 5,000 high-resolution photographs you've taken to reconstruct 
the complete sailing of the portico of the Temple of Hathor at Dendera. Working on it had to be a monumental undertaking. And a curiosity, Jose, do you have any idea as to how many hours it took to complete? Usually what happens with Egyptian temples is that they're built from the inside out, like an onion. The inner parts of the temple are built first, and then more structures are built around and around and around, and they grow outside. What the subject matter of this uh, book is, as you mentioned, the portico of the temple is the entrance of the temple, which is a room that has 24 gigantic columns, like seven story high. The ceiling is around the size of two tennis courts. When you enter into the temple, the first thing that you see is this ceiling. What is beautiful about it is that the original colors have been cleaned up in the last decade. So when you go into this temple and you walk in, as you mentioned before, it's one of the most well-preserved temples in Egypt. When you walk in, it's as if it had been done yesterday. It's one of those very ancient places that we still have, but it's probably one of the best preserved places of that age. I could imagine in Rome, there is the Pantheon, which is contemporaneous of this around the same time, and is in as well in very good shape. But like the other antiquities that we have, the Parthenon or other places around the world, they're, they're just columns and remnants of what the grand use of this was before, and you're led to imagine what they are. But the beauty of this temple is that the whole structure is still in place. When you go there, you don't have to imagine how it was because it is. That's a fantastic thing. So coming back to your question, what I did is I was so impressed with this ceiling uh, the, the first time that I went as a tourist, tantalized by the fact that I didn't know what the, the subject matter of the ceiling was, is clearly it is a celestial ceiling. It's a star map because you see stars and, and you see the constellations of the zodiac on it, which is one of the biggest clues that this is a celestial ceiling. As I started to look for information about the ceiling, to my surprise and, and my frustration, there wasn't easy accessible information about the ceiling. The most of the bulk of the information that you find about the ceiling is academic in nature and is mostly in French or German. So it was really hard to find anything. I decided to write the book that I wanted to find about this place. I was like, this place was so magnificent that I wanted to make a tribute to the goddess Hathor and the anonymous workers that worked 2000 years ago building this magnificent place. That's basically the inception of, the, of how this project started with that crazy idea of let's make this book happen. So I went there and I took 5,000 photos. So I went with a, with a high resolution camera and a professional lens, a tripod, and I walk around systematically underneath the size of two tennis courts. And I took 5,000 images. That was a process that took me 24 hours. I work eight hours a day during three days to take the 5,000 photos of the ceiling. Then the reconstruction itself of digitally stitching the, the images and correcting them for aberrations and colors it took me like three months of work. It was a gigantic pain in the back. That's literally because when I was taking the photos, I had to be staring actually at the floor, not at the ceiling, which is kind of strange because what I had was the, the, the setup was the camera was pointing upwards, but I had an iPad connected to the camera, attached to the camera that was down. So I was always looking at the floor, at the, at the iPad, looking at the ceilings and the pain on the back after three days of doing that was unbearable. That's how I came up with the image. In then Dara, Temple of Time, you explain each panel's astronomical significance from the ancient Egyptian perspective. What, Jose, was their perspective of the zodiac, and how did it differ from how modern-day astrologers look at the zodiac? The zodiac is not Egyptian in origin, because this is a late temple, this is basically 
this temple, as I mentioned, is 2,000 years old. It was built at the time of Cleopatra. Uh, Cleopatra was one of the big patrons of in the construction of this temple at the time when the Romans were already conquering Egypt and Cleopatra was the last pharaoh of, 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 of ancient Egypt. At that time, uh, Egypt was already under the influence of Greece because after Alexander the Great took over uh, Egypt, then all the dynasties that came came after were basically Greek, a uh, Greek general that took over and his family became the pharaohs of Egypt. So what happens is that there is this big infusion and influence of Greek ideas in Egypt, as well the other way around. There is basically crossbreeding between ancient Egypt and ancient Greece. One of them is the Zodiac, which came from Egypt, and it came from Babylon originally. So the Zodiac, the original Zodiac, is Babylonic. In this late temple, the nice thing is that most of the Egyptian astronomy is encoded on it. And one part of that is the incorporation of the uh, constellation of the Zodiac in the ceiling, which became basically part of the knowledge and the lore of astronomical lore of ancient Egypt. There are two aspects uh, about uh, astronomy and astrology in these temples, and these separation between astronomy and astrology is a modern thing. In antiquity, astrology and astronomy were one subject matter, and, and that's it. Astrology comes from the word aster, which means star, right? And logi, which is a, a study. Then astronomy is measurement of stars. So those two things were intermingled and they were interchangeable at the time in antiquity. The function of the stars on the temple, first and foremost, were the, the quality of the knowledge was of importance. The astronomical information of the ancient Egyptians was a matter of survival because the main function of the stars and observing the stars for the Egyptians as in many other cultures, was to be able to foretell when the flooding of the Nile River would happen. Think about Egypt. Egypt is this gigantic desert with the longest river that cuts across what today is Egypt. This river, the Nile River, is a paradox because you are in one of the most arid places in the world, namely where, where Egypt is a huge desert, and what you have is this oasis that cuts Egypt from south to north that becomes, when it floods, when the river floods, the waters go on the banks of the river, and when they recede, what happens is that all the nutrients that come from Ethiopia end up on the banks of the river, and it becomes one of the most fertile lands in the world. So you have this stark contrast between the desert and the fertility of, of the green part on the banks. And it's always this fight because the river has, it floods once a year and then the waters start to recede and it dries up. If you could speed this up and you could see it from the sky, what you would see is how there is these two forces interplaying with each other rhythmically. It's like the water floods the banks, the river expands, then the waters recede, the green comes out. As the year goes by, then the waters start to get shorter and shorter and smaller and meager and meager. And then the dryness starts to beat up the greenness until the new flooding and the waters come out again. And you can imagine this pumping in and out, these ebbs and flows of the water and the dryness. And these two opposite forces fighting with each other. So the livelihood of the Egyptians depended on knowing when the flooding would happen because that determined, given that it was an agricultural society, when they had to plant, when they had to harvest, when every single activity in their society was driven by the flooding of the Nile. So in order for them to plan, what they had to do was 
to be able to try to predict the future on when the flooding would happen. So the priest, the astronomer priest on the temple, so they noticed that the regularities of the stars, in particular the star of Sirius, when it first comes out, then it corresponds to the flooding of the Nile. So it comes a little before the Nile was having its flooding. Then you can imagine these astronomer priests, these astronomers, astrologers, were looking at the stars in order to be able to foretell what would happen in the future. In particular, for vital importance, the flooding of the Nile. They were using the stars in the pure astro astrological term to predict what would happen. That's across the world in ancient civilizations that was the use of the stars because in the northern hemisphere if you go to europe if you cannot tell when winter is coming if you if you miss that you die of hunger and cold right like you have to prepare for the future and you have to be able to predict this they found that different stars correspond with these different natural events around the year that's how they use the stars to predict the future and that's the beginning of astrology and astronomy as well, because what they were doing was measuring the position of the stars in the sky and finding the patterns that they recognize that they start to call the constellations of the zodiac in order to be able to foretell the future. How each panel represents celestial cycles of time from the precision of the equinoxes to the annual cycles of life found along the Nile are covered in the book. How, Jose, was life at that period of time in ancient Egypt portrayed? One of the beautiful things about Egyptian images, like the one you have on your back there, is that they're like kind of cartoons. So they're like comic books in many ways. And you have a lot of scenery. We know a lot about the life at the time of the Egyptians because they depicted that, they, they printed that, they made drawings of different activities like agricultural activities, uh, hunting, all the societal activities were depicted in one way or another. And you can find there, there are so many images that they show you what was the day-to-day -day life in Egypt. You can see that today. And what is curious and, and beautiful is that if you go today to Egypt, it hasn't changed much. Like you go to the banks of the Nile, and you see the people who work on the fields, you know, picking dates or uh, whatever is the plant that they're growing, they're there using pretty much the same techniques that ancient Egyptians used, and they carry things on donkeys. It hasn't changed much, to tell you the truth. The life is very similar. And one thing that you realize once you have been in Egypt and you spend some time there is that these sacred places and the Egyptian culture is the fruit of the Nile, is this autochthonous place that it couldn't happen anywhere else. When you look at the hieroglyphs and you see the imagery that they use of their gods and their characters in the hieroglyphs and so on, they are the animals that live in the Nile. And they are the plants and the animals and the common use objects, the household objects that they use. And it's beautiful because it couldn't happen anywhere else because what they're depicting is their surroundings. They had this beautiful view of the world as a sacred place. So animals were sacred, the river was sacred, it was alive. They lived in a world surrounded by meaning and, and, a, and a divine and sacred place, which is something that I think we could get some of that today. I think one, one of my biggest, and don't take me wrong, I, I, I love the world we live in, I think today is amazing. Like the fact that we have penicillin and, and aesthetics, I think is one of the best things ever. Otherwise you can go back in time and ask all these people who die of pain and infections and all these things that we today, we can, we can solve. And we live in so much comfort today, but one of the things that we have lost in our world today is meaning. So we live in a world where if you think about the, the current ideology in the world is that we are an accident, a cosmic accident, and we live in an arm on an insignificant galaxy, in an insignificant planet that 
revolves around an insignificant star. We're lost among billions of stars. We are just a cosmic accident that just particles bumping into each other and random events, the evolutionary process, and we are here just by happenstance. It's like we're just here and we're an accident and there is no meaning or there is no other purpose rather than to survive. And that's reflected in our culture today. You see it in the abstract art that we do is soulless. The meaning of people in their lives is to work from nine to five so they can go on weekends to the mall and shop and consume because there is nothing else. Because we kill the meaning in the world and it's ideological, it comes from the root. Our spirit, our consciousness is denied. There is no way to explain it in a reductive system like the scientific method that we have today. And again, don't take me wrong, that's an amazing tool for understanding and discovery. But the problem is when you have only one tool and you forget about the other ways of knowing, then just to use the cliche, when you have only one hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's what happens today. It doesn't mean that reason, logic, reduction, and science are not incredible analytical tools, but is one of the legs that we should be standing on but we forgot that we have others. I think that's, to me, the biggest lesson when I look at and, and I think about these places, these magical places like the, the Temple of Hathor at Dendera. The big lesson that I see is that this society was able to last for so long because they live in harmony with their world and they had meaning and, and they had very harsh lives because they were in a harsh environment and they didn't have the facilities that we have today, like they, they have AC and they live in the middle of a desert, like all the nice amenities that we have today. But in a way, they had happy lives because they were meaningful. The ideology, their culture was based on meaning and it was a sacred culture. We live in a utilitarian place where there is no meaning. So we live in a desert and they didn't. The myths, gods and goddesses depicted in the encoded ceiling at the temple of Dendera are examined in your book. Is it possible, Jose, to tell me a, a bit about some of those myths, gods and goddesses? People think that the Egyptians were a polytheistic society because they had many gods. And you see all these thousands of different uh, weird looking creatures with heads of animals. But in reality, what this was, was a system of knowledge of the fundamental forces of nature and of the mind. So gods were anthropomorphical representations of fundamental forces. That's what they were. They had a multiple, like a, a plenitude of gods because they're a bunch of different aspects of forces that rule our existence. And these gods were ways to depict in cartoons those forces. Now, that's a very deep understanding of what these deities represented. From the point of view of the peasants who work on the fields, I'm pretty sure they believe in these gods literally, like just like people believe in religion literally today, and they don't go into the deeper sense of what these things are trying to tell us or teach us. From the point of view of the gods themselves, what you see when you see these gods, what they are is a language, a symbolic language to represent these attributes. If I take, say, a lion, and I have a god that has the head of a lion or a lioness, what happens is that that means bravery because the lioness is brave. The goddess Hathor, which is the goddess of fertility and life, well, her depiction, her effigy, is the cow. And what is the cow? The cow is the animal that produces milk and therefore nurtures. She is the goddess of nurturing, the fertility and nurturing forces of nature. That's what the gods are. So it's just a pictorial language to describe these forces. And everything has meaning. The colors, the shapes, the crowns they use, the positions of their bodies and their hands and so on. 
is a language. Once you start to see and understand, you pass how exotic they are and how foreign they are, and, and you get familiar with them, then you start to see the patterns and you start to see the different parts and aspects of this symbolic language to describe fundamental forces. And you start to see what the patterns are and you start to be able to read into the symbols of what they represent. So that's what these strange creatures depict. At the end, the Egyptians, in a way, believed in a creation from a source, a unique source. So you could say that they were monotheistic in that regard. When it comes to ancient Egyptian structures, such as the pyramids, the Sphinx, the temples at Luxor, and the Temple of Dendera, which is what your book is about, there's been much speculation as to who really built them. Some say alien beings, others say there's no truth to that. What, Jose, has your research shown? Okay, so this is a late temple, and basically the walls of the temple are inscribed with the foundation day of the temple. And it says, which was the, the, the guy who started building this temple was the father of Cleopatra. His name was Ptolemy the 12th, I think. So he was one of the Greek pharaohs that, that was ruling Egypt at the time. So there is no question that this temple in particular was built by Egyptians uh, 2,000 years ago. There is no question about it. If you start to go backwards in time, there's all these temples that you see, they were built by pharaohs and, and their names are inscribed everywhere. Now, when you go to a place, like when you start to go like places like the pyramids, the pyramids at Giza, the, one of the fascinating things is that if you go around all the ancient Egyptian culture, all these temples and, and all the tombs and so on, they're covered with inscriptions from the floor to the roof, right? like they're everywhere. Now, one curious thing about something like the, the Sphinx or, or the pyramids is that they have none. Now, they've been doing excavations around the pyramids where they have found all these villages of all the people who work at the construction of the pyramids. And there's a lot of information that's like probably in the last 15, 20 years they've been doing this. So there is a lot of work on all the infrastructure that was needed in order to build the pyramids. The reality is that we have circumstantial evidence, but nothing, there is no inscription anywhere that says this pyramid was built by, like in the case of this temple that says this temple was found, uh, like the corner store, the stone of this temple was set by Pharaoh XYZ, this date on this year, whatever. We don't have that for the pyramids or the Sphinx. So in that case, everything that we have is circumstantial. Now, one pill that is hard to swallow. So this temple was built in 35 years. The first part, like the portico where the columns are and the ceiling is, was finished 70 or 80 years later on the first century uh, AC. If you look at it, it took to finish this, like the main body of the temple, 30 years and the portico and all the decorations and so on, like a hundred years. You go to any medieval cathedral and you see that there are works of two, three hundred years to build these enormous structures. When you go to the pyramids and you look at the amount of material that is needed to build a pyramid is incredible, it's mind blowing. You need like three million pieces of 10 tons each in order to build a pyramid. The current theory is that the Great Pyramid of Giza was built in 20 years. And that has to be the case because if I'm a pharaoh and I'm building my tomb, and that's going to be the, my place of rest when I die, I cannot start a process of 200 years or 300 years in order to build that because it defeats the purpose. If you want to claim that these pyramids were tombs, they have to be built in the lifespan of a pharaoh, and namely 20 years. If that's the case, that means that you have to place one of these rocks of tens of tons each. Every two minutes, you have to place one of these rocks 
for the 20 years straight in order to build this in 20 years. Imagine that they're supposed not to have the wheel at the time, and they were like using ropes and just human power and donkeys and things like that in order to move. But it's, it's absurd. Like if you try to do that today, you we, even with the machinery that we have today, you cannot place a rock every minute, like for 20 years straight using cranes and electric power and oil that we have today. You can't. So to me, that's hard to swallow. Same thing with the Sphinx. The thing is that we have no idea. The Pharaoh that is supposed to have built the Great Pyramid, the only known image of that Pharaoh is a little statue of this size, like of five inches, which is inconceivable. A guy who would build like one of the biggest, the most monumental structures in history, the only thing that we know of him is this little statue of five inches high. It is it doesn't make any sense. So the reality is we don't know. There is a lot of, of speculation about it, but we don't know. And there are things that don't square. So that's my take on it. As you can see, I'm very skeptical about many things, but I like to use reason and evidence to, when it comes to factual things. Should viewers of Paranormal Yakker want to buy Dendera, Temple of Time, the Celestial Wisdom of Ancient Egypt, how can they do that? As easy as going into Amazon and looking for Dendera Temple of Time is the first thing that shows up there. Jose Maria Barrera, I thank you for being my guest on Paranormal Yakker. I very much enjoyed yakking with you, and I wish you success with your book, Buena Suerte. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure, and I hope I see you soon. Hi everyone, this is Stan Mallon of Paranormal Yakker. I hope you enjoyed the interview you just watched. So that you don't miss any upcoming shows, be sure to subscribe to my free YouTube channel. To do that, just press the subscribe button on your screen.